I'm David Spurgel. I'm a professor at Princeton University. And are you an astronomer? I'm, I'm an astronomer or astrophysicist. I spent most of my career as a cosmologist thinking about questions like the age of the universe, how did the universe begin, how did galaxies emerge, and in recent years I've been more and more involved in thinking about extrasolar planets and how we detect them. I've been leading the NASA uh, study on building a new mission that would be carrying out a program both of cosmology and detecting extrasolar planets called WFIRST. Do uh, you have any hobbies? I enjoy bicycling. I re run regularly, run half marathons typically. How often do you do that? About once or twice a year. Wow. And uh, favorite music? Um, you know, like many people, I'm stuck in the 80s, <laughs> rock and roll. So. Okay. And uh, what are you reading now? A um, bunch of things. The uh, I mean, last science fiction I read was The Martian. The Martian by? Oh, I forget the guy's name. It's great. Oh. Very, it's going to be made into a movie shortly. Uh, the Martian. The Martian. It was in, in, in uh, you're reading a book about aliens. Uh, no. It's about a, the, a human stuck on Mars. Oh, I see. Okay. So it's a book about humans. Okay. But, um, and um, actually, the thing I'm reading right now is um, a book that uh, it's a, uh, looking at the rise of, uh, uh, of civilizations and uh, trying to understand um, uh, how democracies arise. Not collapse. No. And not, I read collapse. Not 1137 no. or something. No. Okay. Are we alone? I don't know is the clearest answer I can give on that. Um, my guess is we're probably not, but I, that's based, that for me is purely speculation. There are a couple things I think I know um, based on work that my colleagues have done. I think we know there are huge numbers of stars out there, billions and billions on our galaxy alone and billions of galaxies. We know that planets are about as common as stars. So there are lots of planets out there and I would say that I think it's very likely that there are many, and by many I would guess of order 100 million planets that are broadly like the Earth, or size at similar distances from the Sun. And many with water, I suppose. And many with water. Now, Venus comes close to being an Earth-like planet. It's comparable distance, comparable temperature, it's a little bit closer in. And just because it seemed to be a little bit closer in, its history ends up being very different from the Earth, and it doesn't have liquid water. So I don't think we know enough yet about how planets evolved to say of those, say, 100 million, couple hundred million, um, which actually have water, have conditions um, necessary for life, have sta fairly stable orbits and so on. But I think a conservative guess would be there are at least 10 million planets that have um, are fertile places for life. Are the fertile planet. places. But that I mean, a place like the Earth, which has fairly stable temperatures over a long term, has liquid water, um, has an atmosphere uh, that, uh, you know, what might be important for Earth is the fact that we have the inorganic carbon cycle. We have ways of getting the CO2 out of the atmosphere into the uh, rock, and that's tied to the fact that we do have continents and interesting geology, right? We put, uh, um, so that, what size planet you need for that, whether you have to be really right, very close to one Earth mass, um, is not yet understood. So that's, but I think a lot of planets are, like, are likely to be like that. That's what I mean, um, you know, a potentially habitable planet. Now, can you distinguish between necessary and sufficient? I mean, you're talking probably about necessary things, but how about sufficient? Um, necessary is easier. Yes. So that's why I've been going through necessary. Now, to me, to answer this question about, and this is really following in some ways the Drake equation, right? What is you know, the number of uh, alien civilizations out there? Um, to me, there are two big or at least three big uncertainties. One is, how often does it take to go from conditions for life to life? You know, how do you get that first cell? And I think we are, just don't know the answer yet. We don't know, given the right chemical ingredients, how often will life arise? It, we only have one data point, and we can't really extrapolate from that. 
Well, well, for example, we we look at life and we know that it's not made out of anything special or unobtainium. It's made out of the most common elements in the universe. So that's at least some information that molecular evolutionists, people who study molecular evolution, can use to say, hey, I don't need a magic ingredient. No, the conditions are there, but how do you assemble, and it's easy to see, and people do see, forming simple proteins and assembling simple carbohydrates and assembling lipid chains. But given those ingredients, if you ask, if I have a soup of those things, and it must go from one step from those simple ingredients to something as complex as a cell, the cell becomes extremely improbable. And if, that's, if, if life must take that huge leap at once, mm -hmm. we are the only, uh, Earth is the only planet that has life in our galaxy. On the, and on the other hand, there may, very well may be, and I suspect are, intermediate steps that are viable, things simpler than the simplest life forms we see now. And if you just need to take a series of intermediate steps that we've not yet determined, it is possible that life is much more common. But this is something that I just, is this area of active study and I think we have no idea what the right answer is to. Are we looking for these intermediate steps? Absolutely, absolutely. The people, uh, uh, chemists, biologists uh, working on these things now. And then another hard step is um, how do you get from single cell life to multi complex multicellular life? And that took a long time. You know, the one piece of data we have is that took a long time on Earth. If you look at Earth doing most of its history, it had life. It's had life for, you know, at least three quarters of its history. But it's only been in the last few hundred million years, last 10%, that we've had complex life. And of course, it's only been during the last mil few million years we've had humanoid life. And during the last 10,000 years that we've had what we've called civilization, based on agriculture and things. And during the last 500 years, maybe, if you want to say we'd have a technological civilization and we've been spacefaring for maybe 50. So when I asked you the question, are we alone, you said probably not. Were you referring to l simple life or were you referring to technological life? Uh, both. 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 Um, now, with technological life, the, another thing we are uh, certainly ignorant of is, is technological life, uh, um, how dangerous is it to life? Uh, to be an advanced technology. We could have blown ourselves up with nuclear weapons. We haven't yet. Um, that may be luck. We have not yet destroyed the planet and made it uninhabitable. Uh, we, we are working on it. There are things we're doing, to, there are many things we're doing that are degrading our environment. Um, will we destroy our, our planet for life? We won't destroy our planet. The Earth's going to be here but we may make life conditions um, so difficult that human life ends. Um, you know, and that, we're not there right now, obviously, but if we're asking do things last a long time, we don't know. So these intelligent aliens that you think are probably out there or might be out there, uh, are they going to be Democrats or Republicans? Neither. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that, uh, to show my political prejudice. If they're going to survive, they, they're probably not Republicans. <laughs> okay. um, okay. not, are, they gonna, are they gonna be male and female? Um, very unlikely. Um, though, uh, let's get back to that. I, I, um, let me just say first, they're gonna be very different from us in many ways because um, the characteristic time scale to think about for astronomy is a billion years. If you look at a nearby star, the nearest star is a billion years older than the sun or a billion years younger. So if there's life on another planet, it is either a billion years less advanced than us, simple single cell life, or a billion years more advanced. Life a billion years more advanced, I, we have no idea what it will be like. When we think about how much our civilization has changed, say, in the last 500 years, what will humanity be like 500 years from now? It's a hard question to answer. Even harder, is take 
2,000 steps like that. Well, that's 2,000 steps of 500 years is only a million years. So then take that million year step, which is no one knows what humanity will be like, what our planet will be like a million years from now. Take a thousand more steps like that. And that's how much more advanced any alien is than us that we're likely to come into contact with. So they are very likely to be completely different from us. Now, what path will evolution take? And this is something I think evolution on Earth informs us. Um, evolution does not require that you have something exactly like DNA. It just requires that you have ways of reproducing and random mutation. And what we've seen on Earth, for example, is it's very good to sense your environment. Eyes, in some form, or photosynthesis cells, I think originated five or six independent times just on our planet because it's good to see. It's good to know, is there someone over there about to eat me, or is there some good food right there? So it's good to sense your environment, it's, uh, and light is going to be there on any planet. So I actually think aliens will have eyes. So one way to, uh, to analyze or to make good guesses about what aliens will be like is to see what has evolved multiple times independently on Earth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so I think that we'll have, being mobile is a good thing, though trees are doing fine. How about having a head? It's not clear, you, you know, you certainly want some way of sensing environment, processing things, so to have something like a brain, but concentrate in one place, yeah, I, don't, I don't know, ants have multiple centers that um, control different parts of their body. It's not so centralized a brain. So I don't think, you know, all we know is what we can look at at evolution and guess on based on that what might apply. And I, I don't think evolution, like we have a clear answer there on life with eyes. A couple of weeks ago, Yuri Milner dedicated $100 million for the next 10 years to support SETI. Uh, what do you think of that? Um, well, I think it's a great thing that we're that this uh, area is getting support. It's an exciting and promising area. I don't think we know what the answers are. Um, my own prejudice is traditional SETI. By that I mean using radio antennas to look for signals from alien civilizations um, is so 1950s. So, so yesterday. Um. So yesterday. <laughs> and that's because you know when it was conceived, Humans communicated mostly through radio transmissions. That's how we sent most of our information. People saw things on the radio, and heard things on the radio, saw things on TV. We were sending episodes of I Love Lucy out to space. Today, we send most of our information not by radio, but by optical fiber. That's how we transmit most of our data. And most of that data, even including that sent in the radio, is sent in a compressed form. You take the information and you compress the signal so you can send more information and less data. And what compression does is it makes the data look statistically the same as noise. So it's very difficult to pick up a compressed signal and know that it has um, information unless you have the code to break it. So while we have been sending I live loosely out in a form that's easy to watch. If the aliens want to see Game of Thrones, mm. which is being sent up on cable on HBO. That'll be harder. That'll be harder. Oh. So basically, I think you can only detect civilizations like our own between 1920 and about 2000. So I think for SETI to work, um, we're going to have to think about ways of detecting life that are broader than what's been done before. So, for example? I don't know the right answer, actually. Neutrinos? X-rays? Gravity waves? Uh, the little like we know from the evolution of our civilization so far is we've always shifted to higher energies in how we're transmitting information. So uh, X-rays seem to be, um, to me, a good way. Um, Something I've been actually never looked into, but my 
uh, when I've thought a little bit about what would be the most effective way of transmitting a lot of information if I was an advanced civilization brightly. I would do it in the x-rays around a black hole. Black holes are surrounded by accretion disks of gas. And, some of, and those power, produce a powerful signal, primarily in the x-ray. And I'm an advanced alien civilization. I have good enough computational simulations that I know if I add a little bit of mass at the edge of the disk, it'll perturb things. The whole thing's unstable. It's a lot like the butterfly flapping its wings producing a, a, a hurricane. So a small change in an accretion disk probably produces a, a very noticeable change in the emission in the x-ray. So you'd be so adding dot, 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 dot. I'd be adding <laughs> dot, dot, dot at the edge of the um, accretion disk. And that would be sending out an incredibly powerful signal. I'd be using a black hole as an amplifier. Mm. And intriguingly, there are very complex signals coming from every black hole we have in our galaxy. <laughs> Most likely, it's astrophysical processes. But, uh, but perhaps, if I had to speculate wildly, these are signals from an advanced civilization that they're transmitting to someone, for, for others who are sophisticated enough to hear them. So have you recommended to Yuri Milner that he uh, look at the X-ray, uh, invest in X-ray telescopes as well and time sequencing there? Uh, no, I've not. But um, one of the smart things I think Yuri Milner did was he gave the money He's not, you know, he gave the money himself to this idea, but Yuri is not giving it out to individuals. He's asked Jeff Marcy, who is one of the leaders in the search for planets. He's discovered many planets himself through uh, radio velocity work and through um, um, his work with Kepler, and has thought a lot about this to lead the effort to give out the money. Okay, have you ever seen a UFO? Uh, I've seen things that I don't know what they are, but I don't think I've ever seen anything that I have any reason to believe is an alien craft. And what, what were those things? Oh, I'm sure I've seen military space, military test vehicles. Military test vehicles? Where did you see them? Uh, where have I seen military test vehicles? Mostly at military bases. But I mean, you see something in the distance that's an airplane. Uh -huh. you know, what is an, un an unidentified flying object? Mm -hmm. You know, it's an airplane that hasn't gotten close enough for me to see it's an airplane yet. Right, That's right. most of the time what it is. Um, have I seen anything where they buzz around, follow me around? No. Have you seen um, anything that you saw and you couldn't, oh, I don't know what that is. Oh, I want, have, how long has that sense of, I do not know, maybe it's weird, maybe it's, I start to get afraid. Oh, I've never gotten afraid. Never no. gotten afraid. No, I mean, I've seen, um, the coolest thing I've seen, which I identified, uh, was, um, I've seen a, a meteorite come down, and you actually see the trail and you hear the explosion. Oh. That was over, yeah, that, that's an amazing, you know. If I didn't know uh, um, what it was, mm -hmm. I would think that was an amazing thing. So if you weren't an astronomer. If I weren't an astronomer, and I saw this incredible trail across the sky, heard an explosion, mm -hmm. um, and then of course you actually find a rock and a hole, which I didn't, but it was later. I mean, this was a, this is one of those ones that, made the news and I just happened to be outside mm. um, when, I, when it happened. Um, that was, I, mean, I identified that flying object. That was the most amazing <laughs> flying object uh, I've seen. So uh, I imagine you've, you haven't been abducted by aliens then? Uh, neither by aliens um, from outside the solar system or people who've entered the United States illegally, neither group. Okay, so <laughs> as far as you know. That's <laughs> as as you know. Okay. Yeah. All right, so uh, the other day I was talking to uh, a guy, a street musician. I said, uh, do you think we're alone? He said, absolutely not. And I said, what is the evidence? And he said, the pyramids. The pyramids are so t closely aligned with, the, I don't know, the north that they couldn't have been done by a primitive people. And uh, then I guess he was thinking about these spaceships that have been drawn by tribes in mm -hmm. Africa. That, and I guess he, maybe he's read Chariots of the God by mm -hmm. Van Dyneken, and maybe he's heard about the Nazca, yeah. the landing strips. So what, do you, as a scientist, do you accept that evidence as for the existence of aliens? No, in fact, I read Van Dyneken. I actually found it to be remarkably um, racist because it basically said, you know, 
these non-European civilizations couldn't figure out their astronomy or how to line things up. He doesn't say Stonehenge is built by aliens. That lines up just as well. Mm -hmm. He basically said these people were not sophisticated enough to build the pyramids. Mm -hmm. Yet ancient Egypt was an incredibly complex civilization, most complex civilization in the world arguably at the time. And um, people know how to reconstruct it. I mean, you know, uh, I can tell you who built the pyramids, my ancestors. <laughs> you know, I, I'm of Jewish descent, and my ancestors were the ones pushing those blocks, being whipped. <laughs> right. okay. So we built the pyramids. Right. Now, some clever Egyptian architect probably was the one who said where to put the blocks there. Um, but I don't see any evidence. And what's intriguing about um, almost all claims I've ever read of aliens, alien abductions, is they are remarkably like us. They show so limited imagination. And to go back to my point earlier, about any alien civilization is a billion years more advanced than us. Yet they're showing up and always using technology that's very comparable to what we have right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, how about some, you must have heard lots of weird ideas about what aliens could be. Some of them would be crazy and stupid. Others might give you, well, maybe. What are some of the weirder ideas that you've heard? One of my favorites is an idea due to Freeman Dyson. And he basically talked about the idea of plants on uh, distant comets and pointed out that, you know, what you need for life is liquid water. And just because you're far away, doesn't mean you can't concentrate light for liquid water. The idea of this is you had plants that basically grew mirrors, so you had something that's shiny, and they would constant. imagine the mirrors like nails, they're dead things, um, but the mirrors concentrate light to a spot mm -hmm. to produce water. Mm -hmm. And that's, and the living part of the plant would be sitting there growing mirrors and you could be quite far from the sun. And his idea for this was that you would then have this uh, mirror concentrating light, and if the comet looks at, you look at just the right angle, you would get a brilliant flash of light in reflection uh -huh. from all the plants pointing at you. Oh, and great. this would only work if you were, the sun was directly behind you, uh -huh. and you were looking outwards. And so that's one of my favorite ideas. <laughs> see, okay. How about in, any Star Trek ideas that you think are semi-plausible? Um, you know, Star Trek um, was an incredibly creative show, and I loved it as a, as a kid, and I still enjoy thinking about the episode sometimes, um, though I'm not really a hardcore Trekkie, but it's a great show. Um, most of the aliens, of course, were remarkably humanoid. They were basically people wearing a little bit of makeup. It was a cheap, they were doing it on budget. Um, my, you know, I'm trying to remember the name of this, but one of the very creative things they had was the idea of a silicon-based life form mm -hmm. that was very difficult to recognize for us and radically different from our own. And, you know, I think that to me was a, a, an interesting and actually I think plausible idea. Mm -hmm. um, it may turn out that life out there is very different from life on Earth and went through a path that's a quite, quite a different one and we would have a difficult time recognizing it. I mean, one way to think about how hard it is to recognize things that are different is, you know, when I uh, went to high school and took biology, I learned about two broad classes of life, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So, you know, the simple or simpler life forms are bacteria, more complex cellular life forms. We were missing a whole huge class of life, archaea. And we were missing at the time many of the extremophiles that we now know occupy a broad range of environment. There was lots of life there in lots of environments that we just didn't have the imagination to look for. So. I suspect, and this is based on what I've learned as an astronomer, that the universe will clum up with things that surprise us 
and are beyond our current imagination. How about if there are extra dimensions and the aliens have figured out how to use these extra dimensions or live in them and occasionally they come into our three and then go out again? It's, it's possible. Um, you know, since, as I said earlier, aliens could be a billion years more advanced than us, it's hard to know what they could or couldn't do. Our current speculations on higher dimensions suggest those higher dimensions are, are very, very small. And in order to access those higher dimensions, it takes a tremendous amount of energy. And, uh, but, um, you know, at this point, our ideas about extra dimensions are speculations, very interesting speculations that may end up tying together ideas of quantum mechanics and general relativity, but certainly not well-established physics. How so about, it's hard to know. How about aliens who have, uh, I don't know, able to manipulate the vacuum fluctuations on tiny scales in there, that's where they live? Um, it's, you know, uh, all these things are potentially possible. I have no, you know, uh, really no idea of the, uh, if there's energy to be gotten out of those scales and if life can evolve to do that. I mean, in life as we know it uh, is made up of complex molecules and that sends a certain scale or a certain amount of energy. But that's, that's the way things have happened on Earth. Uh, what direction, uh, what other directions things take, and you know, even what life will be like here a billion years from now. It's very hard to know. Now, when I ask you questions, you react, you think about the answers. But if you didn't know how to think and you just felt about it, you have an irrational side like all of us. If you're just irrationally trying to feel about answers instead of think about them, what would you, or, or you, have you had dreams about aliens? Or I'm trying to get to the more emotional side of you here. <laughs> um, so the problem with that is this is actually a topic I've thought some about. So, you know, there, there are things where you react and you're driven by your emotions and your loves and fears and hates. This is a topic where I've actually had time to sit back and, and think about. Um, you know, I think at the emotional level, I think I want the answer to are we alone to be yes, to be no. I don't, um, it seems very lonely if in this vast universe we are the only life form. And I think there's a certain attractiveness to the idea that there are aliens out there uh, who are um, much more advanced than us and hopefully evolved in a way in that, uh, you know, the, as Martin Luther King has said, you know, the, the march of history is long, but it, I get it right, but it, it tends towards justice. And that I think you can look at for all the ups and downs of human civilization, that our civilization as a whole has become more moral, more just with time. Um, you know, and I, I see this just as American in our, our history of uh, who gets included in society. And we went from a society that only uh, wealthy uh, white males got to vote and have influence. And that group still has a lot more influence than the average person. But you know, we've recognized the personhood of, of women, of African Americans, of gays. And there's a long way to go at all being treated equal. But there's progress. That's what, as Martin Luther King says, the march of history goes towards, towards justice. And maybe more evolved civilizations, just in order for them to be stable, will be moral. And uh, you know, I think for all of uh, human history, we have liked the idea of someone who will care for us out there, more powerful, watching for us. And I think uh, for many, uh, who like to speculate about aliens, it, it provides a comfort and a structure that religion provides for others. You, you remind me of Carl Sagan here. And when I, um, however, Carl Sagan grew up in the Cold War, and I always interpreted some of his looking for 
I don't know, moral aliens or higher powers that were kind of benign, was a search to get out of this uh, McCarthyist era mm -hmm. of, hey, America is great and you communists are bad, and uh, to be more inclusive or to increase the in-group. Is that something that, uh, what, how would you characterize Carl Sagan's, uh, I guess, promotion or beliefs in this, in, with regard to Are We Alone? Um, you think Sagan was an optimist? Sagan was someone who uh, believed deeply in science, who had hoped for, uh, uh, that this would be a path towards um, uh, world peace. World peace. <laughs> yeah. World peace. Yeah. <laughs> like they say in beauty contests. It's absolutely. <laughs> world peace. Okay. Now, a lot of the people who are taking this course are not scientists or astronomers, and so, you know, this idea of they haven't thought these things through. So, how, what do you think are the biggest misconceptions that, I don't know, non astronomers or the man in the street or, would have about this question? I think the most common is a very is is a view of aliens that are very that they if they're out there they are so similar to us, you know, and it's shaped by our movies and our imagination, and some of it's shaped by the fact that you know Hollywood would much rather have an alien that's kind of human like and attractive. I think so the biggest misconception that was where I was going. <laughs> I think the biggest misconception is. You, that you can have sex with aliens. And that's not going to happen. It's not happening. Because, I mean... It's, they're not coming here. <laughs> aliens are not coming here for you to get laid. That, that, that's... <laughs> I want to clarify that. <laughs> and vice versa. You're, you shouldn't go looking for aliens if you're trying to get laid. No, right? yeah. You, you, but, you but, want an emotional relationship? But Spock had a father who's a Vulcan, a mother that's, who's a human, so... Right? That's not happening. Hi, Lars. I tried to register with you, but uh, you weren't there. Okay, when, when are you? In about two or three minutes. All right, that's okay. All right. You know, um, if you want um, uh, unlimited love, buy a dog. <laughs> I see. Adopt a dog, even better. I see. <laughs> okay, and uh, so let me ask you again Are we alone? I don't know. And it's how? A, it's a, I think it's a fascinating and deep and profound question and one that um, we as a species should be striving to answer and I um, it is one of the things that's driving um, a lot of my own science to understand what's out there um, but it's uh, it's a, a question that we don't know the answer to